humans, you have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Stop in the name of love before you break my heart. Take it over. <laughs> it's actually very good lyrics. Break this this style does sometimes break hearts. <laughs> it breaks hearts, maybe even friendships. How's it going, everybody? What's up? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. What are we talking about today, Jimmy? Today we have a very fun topic with a very fun guest. It is all about you know, we've talked a lot about deck building, how to win, how to politic, but we haven't really spoken much about how to stop your opponent from winning and secure victory for yourself. And it's also going to make you a better player overall, I believe. So, of course, to do that, we're going to need a special guest, someone that, is, if you've watched Extra Turns, knows a thing or two about stopping the opponent from winning. Please give a warm welcome to the one and only Jesper Ising. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be back. I look <laughs> forward to doing this thing with you. <laughs> it's kind of Jesper month on the command zone, as That's we talked true. about, because we have a lot of stuff going on, including the Extra Turns episode, which if you haven't watched it, just came out, uh, I believe, a week in the issue week. ago. Yeah, now. Uh, no spoilers here, but Jesper does have some very interesting tactics that we will be talking about today. But before we get into that, Jesper has also contributed something amazing to the command zone, and that is a play mat called Epic Play, and Jesper did the art for it. And in fact, Josh, I believe we have something special for our viewers today. Yeah, so... Um Jesper, despite being a amazing commander player, is also a world-renowned artist. Yes. Uh, but Jesper, we've done so, something special here. I don't think you've seen this yet. Yeah. We have. Show me. Yeah, we've <laughs> we've animated the new playmat art in the game night style. Uh, the oh, art yeah? was just too good. We I was like, we have to animate this thing uh, because it's so sweet. So, well, this is going to be the world premiere of the animation for the epic play oh. artwork. Take it away. Wow. 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 Yeah. Sick. So, <laughs> can we do that for every single piece of art on the planet? Because that was awesome. Yeah, I'm sorry to our audio yeah. only listeners because they're not getting the full effect here. They just heard some stuff. Uh, <laughs> if you're watching this on YouTube, though, you're looking at the playmat right now. This is definitely like Jesper's signature style. Yeah. Uh, has a very, oh, yes. Yeah, has, has a very clear, clean, like, uh, figure, character, couple of characters in the middle. It's just beautiful. The Kickstarter for this playmat is going on right now. We're going to have the links in the show notes. It's a limited time only thing. That's how Kickstarter works. So at the end of the Kickstarter campaign, this playmat will no longer be available. We're only making it this one time. So if you want to get your hands on it, and trust us, you definitely do, yep. make sure to go into the show notes below this video and click on that link and secure your order sooner rather than later. You don't want to wait, forget about it, come back, and then the Kickstarter is over. Yeah, you definitely want to make sure that you get this uh, Kickstarter before it ends. We're also going to have it on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of those places. So you'll be able to find the links. And of course, Jesper, the art that you did for this, I am, I'm not joking, man. This is one of my favorite art pieces I think I've ever seen in Magic. It's custom to this playmat. You don't want to miss out. Yeah, I was I was once told that my art uh, looked like uh, candy wrap paper. <laughs> and I think the guy, the, the guy who said it, the guy who said it, I think he meant it as an insult. Uh, but I took it to heart, and I was like, "Damn right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that into, I'm gonna make that a style." I love it. I yeah, I, I love your style because, uh, it, it, like, the main characters really pop in your style. It's there's never any trouble like figuring out the focal point. And really, one of the great things about this playmat yeah. is even from pretty far away, you can really make out the dragon and the dragon rider and get the feel of the piece. Um, yeah. Even, you know, even if you're not right next to it, which, you know, not that artwork that's very busy can't be good, but this, this, I don't know, there's just something about the way you control the uh, perception of the viewer so well. And the colors. Mm. I love the colors. Yeah. Just like candy wrap paper, right, Jesper? <laughs> yeah. This is a moss bar turned into a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, before we get into the main topic here, we got to talk about our sponsors, cardkingdom.com slash command zone. You know, Double Masters just came out, Zendikar Rising's on the horizon. We've got all kinds of sets that have come down the pipe lately. If you're like us, you're behind. I haven't even opened a single pack of Jumpstart. I don't even own a Jumpstart <laughs> card, like a single one right now. I need to go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone and order those cards. Uh, and, and they are the best 
not only in like the way they grade the cards, they're going to come in very good condition. They also just get you the stuff so fast. So Card Kingdom is the one I trust if I need that card or want that card, you know, yeah. very soon for like if I'm going to play on Spell Table or something tomorrow night. Uh, Card Kingdom is the only place to go because they're going to get it to you when they say they are. Yeah, and their customer service is top notch. They're immediately responsive. They also will sometimes include little like custom arts if you ask them like Tokens, really yeah. silly requests. Yeah, so they're they're really great. We've been working for them a long time. Another awesome sponsor of the show is Ultra Pro. In fact, we trust Ultra Pro so much that every single playmat we've ever sold has been printed on Ultra Pro because they just have the absolute top quality playmats for the game. It's it's the way to protect your cards both in style and safely. Not to mention. We have something in front of us here that I've been waiting for a, for a long time, and it's the new Eclipse sleeves that have glossy fronts so that your foils and everything, or card arts behind it, are going to shine right through and they're going to look brilliant, especially if you have Jesper Icing art cards in your uh, your deck. Yeah, I know a lot of people <laughs> um, had small complaints about the original Eclipse sleeves in that the translucent side of the sleeve was a little bit milky and it would tend to dull the colors on your card, especially like foils and stuff like that. These are the ones that really show off the vibrancy of your cards. So the Pro Gloss sleeves are new from Ultra Pro and really, really sweet. In fact, am I going to have to change all like 25 <laughs> of my decks to Pro Gloss sleeves now? I actually like the matte on some of my decks, but I do have a couple blinged out decks, and I'm sure DJ will agree with me here, that need to be seen in their full glory. Okay, I like that take because that's just less re-sleeving. Because <laughs> yeah. so, all my Eclipse sleeves are still good. Like they don't break ever, so... I don't want to like, what am I going to do with the old sleeve? So maybe I'll just re-sleeve like five of my decks. There you go. Yeah. yeah the ones that have, you know, <laughs> like your Vile Smasher Thrasios fully uh, customed out, blinged out deck. I want to talk about one more cool thing from Ultra Pro because they've got a new collection called, they're calling the Mythic Collection. It's these new deck boxes and they're super classy. They've got like stitching yeah. and very high quality and the magnets are like super strong. So they've got different size deck boxes. This one holds two. Jimmy's got one that holds one, but also has room for like dice and stuff. Yep, yep. Uh, so this the Mythic Collection from Ultra Pro, also very snazzy, very classy, uh, new product from them. All right, and finally, the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone, you get all kinds of perks and rewards. One thing you get is to watch game nights, extra turns earlier than the general public. Also, those are ad-free versions of those shows, so mm -hmm. you don't have to deal with ads. Um, and also, we shout out one lucky patron every single episode, and this episode is dedicated to, to Marcos Luvano. Marcos. Marcos. You rock. You rock. All right, let's move right into the topic, stopping your opponents from winning. Now, we often get lots of emails where people are having trouble winning, or statistically they feel like, oh, I'm just always losing in Commander, and here's the thing, you're usually losing in Commander when there's four players at the table. What that means, though, is that one of your opponents is actively winning, and you know there's a lot of reasons as to why you're losing, and people often blame it on, oh, the power level of their deck is too high, or they just have better cards, their card quality is better, so I can never beat that. But I think the real reasons might be a little more nuanced so let's dive right into it Jesper actually brought this up and he said that he was influenced by Melissa DeTora who was on a Game Nights episode and uh, Jesper do you want to talk about the what I'm calling the Melissa DeTora effect yeah sure I uh, when I saw that g gameplay on on that episode I went home and built that deck right away and tried testing it out and piloting it a lot of people did that uh, because yeah. it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it seems so fun to play. But when I saw the deck list and I started collecting all the cards from my binders, I noticed there was cards that I was curious about why at all she would play them. I thought it was stupid to include cards like Stony Silence in the deck. Oh. So, uh, what, what was your thought I, when you saw Stony Silence? Why did you think it was bad? Uh, because it stops your soul ring, your own soul ring. <laughs> and uh, uh, the other card I noticed was uh, Ground Seal. And when I saw that, I was like, this is so conditional. I'm never playing cards like that. This is stupid to play. And then I kind of thought, ah, Melissa is not stupid. It might be me that's stupid. <laughs> and then I start looking more into it. And I, 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 it dawned on me that you might, you might include small cards like that that are very conditional, but that will do a lot of damage to a single deck strategy. And that might be okay. Yeah, and they actually did do a lot. If you guys watch the episode, uh, and we'll maybe show a clip here, Stony Silence stops Professor from equipping Swiftfoot Boots onto his commander and mm. dealing what could be a ton of damage, maybe even lethal commander damage. So in that small instant, yeah. you're right, it does turn off a soul ring, but in Melissa's deck, obviously, it's going to draw her a card being an enchantment, but it shuts down other people's cards, sometimes more than your own. Yeah, let, let me read Stony Silence for those that don't know it. It's one in a white for an enchantment. It says, activated abilities of artifacts... 
can't be activated. Hmm. It doesn't. It doesn't like exclude mana abilities too. That's just mana rocks are turned off. Uh, and yeah. and the reason it doesn't allow Professor to equip uh, the Swiftfoot boots is because equip is an activated ability. So, yeah, interesting to sort of have the realization that you know a narrow card could still be really good just because when it's good, it's amazing. Right. Yeah, and then I also uh, figured out. Yep, yeah, but. If it hurts you, or if it's not uh, very good to play at that moment, just don't play it. Right. Then it's just a wasted card in your hand, and that might also be okay. <laughs> but if it's good, and if it the condition is right, and you're up against the an artifact deck, this is just a fantastic card. Yeah. So I started looking into cards that might do the same kind of thing to an opponent, and I slowly started adding Rest in Peace into decks and noticed how devastating an effect it has. Yeah, absolutely. And not just that, but you actually showed off a deck that you built that was kind of influenced by Melissa's deck, right, on the most extra uh, 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 recent episode of Extra Turns. Can you describe to us yeah. what that deck is and what made you to build it? Yeah, it's a hate bear deck, and uh, it uh, it has uh, Thrashius and Timna as the commanders. And uh, what I like about hate, hate bears is that uh, they're still creatures. They can still attack. You can still do a lot of damage, but they will influence the opponent and make it a bit hard for the opponent to actually play magic at a at a, the same level as you. Mm. And uh, so so it levels the field when I'm playing small creatures. If I'm also stalling the opponents a little bit, it buy it buys me time. Yeah, hate bears is funny because it, it sort of stops the opponents from doing broken things, right? Like, right. it doesn't stop them from yeah. doing anything. They can still do stuff, yeah. but it's harder to do, you know, the chain of things all in the same turn that really have the huge impact. Exactly. Yeah. So it's more like you're you're sticking a little wrench in the wheel of their uh, value, and uh, and 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 you try to run faster than them. Right. And I like that my hate bear deck is not a lock deck. It's not a, a complete stacks deck that makes it impossible for the opponents to play magic. It's more just making it a little bit more difficult <laughs> so I can I can gain a little bit of advantage. Yeah, I want to address that really quick because anybody who is calling the hate bears deck a stacks deck in the comments and there was a lot you don't know what stacks is. <laughs> the deck's not a stacks yeah. deck. It didn't have stasis, winter orb, static orb, any of the really locked down. Stacks is trying to make it so that the opponents can't do anything. Right. The hate bear stuff yeah. is trying to slow down your opponents. But if you notice in that game on extra turns, uh, I won't spoil it, but all players, including Jesper's opponents, are able to do plenty of stuff. The game still happens. Yeah. Everyone's doing things. In fact, it's a fairly close game. He's not trying to stop yes. his opponents from playing magic at all. He's just saying like, hey, if you're going to try and do like five things in a turn and storm off or whatever, well, that, well that's going to be hard. Yeah. But if you want to cast like yeah. a spell or two on your turn, you're still going to be able to do that. I like the fact that it's a soft lock. It's not a lock even, but it's a it's very fair actually. It, and also because most of the hate bears is the 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 stacksy part is tied to creatures. Right. So all of you should be able to deal with creatures. It's not that it's impossible to stop or, or do something against it. I think it's pretty fair, actually. Well, in that case, let's actually talk about unfair things, which were uh, were what I'm calling un sort of the common win cons of Magic, the things that decks like the Hate Bears decks and Stacks decks in general tend to put a, like, you know, put them through quicksand or, like you said, throw a wrench in their plans. I mean, I think if we're going to talk about stopping the opponents from winning, then you have to know the common ways by which people win, right? right. You have to be prepared for what's going to come at you. So, yeah, let's talk about the common win cons. I think the biggest one for mm -hmm. that I think most Magic casual players see are sort of the one big spell. So Expropriate is a card we talk about all the time. Uh, Insurrection, your Crater Hoof Behemoth swinging for the win. Um, if you're a Jesper art mm -hmm. fan, Tooth and Nail as well to grab a combo piece out of your deck. Two combo pieces. Two combo yes. pieces, right. Or even cards like Exsanguine or Torment of Hailfire, which is how much mana can I sink into this at one point? If no one's going to stop me, then boom, it's going to almost guarantee win the game on the spot or at least close it out over a couple of turns. Um, now, obviously yeah. these are a bit riskier because as you know, the mana cost on them is so high. So another way that I think is very common for sort of people that are just getting into the game are infinite combos. So we've seen this a bunch. Kiki Jiki and Zealous Conscripts. You can make infinite copies and swing in for the win. The new Heliod and Walking Ballista. Jesper, you actually said you made a mono white yeah. deck. Is this combo in there? 
Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> because bo- both piece, uh, I mean, the artifact is super easy to tutor out, and that combo is just a very good combo. <laughs> yeah, Heliod gives Walking Ballista Life, life link. link, and then gives counters uh, yeah. to Walking Ballista so that you can ping people endlessly, infinitely. infinitely yeah. yeah, I mean, you're in mono white, so I don't yeah, begrudge yeah. anybody figuring out <laughs> any way you can win if you're in mono white. Yeah, good luck in general. Yeah, uh, gloves off at that point when you're playing mono white. You're not playing fair. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you are playing. You're, you're, you're being playing held back fair. enough by the way the game's designed, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Painter Servant yeah. was recently unbanned, and it combos with stuff like uh, Grindstone. There's Micaeus and Triskelion. Right. Mike and Track, probably what you'd go get with Tooth and Nail if you wanted to go infinite combo. Um, there's Jimmy's favorite, the Mind Slaver loops. Yeah, finding a way to take someone's turn over and over again until they can't play the game anymore. Also a way to, quote unquote, go infinite in a way. Um, I would say Josh's favorite <laughs> is the next common win con, which is a drawn out value engine. And this never wins the game on the spot, but just says, hey, I'm going to play the game and get so much more value over time that it's going to be impossible for you to catch up. So cards like the Great yeah. Henge uh, or Yarok the Desecrated, as we saw uh, Amaz take to really like powerful effect. Panharmonicon, even just like multiple swings with the Annihilator effect is enough to take out a player. And that is what I would call a drawn out value engine where you have the ability to say, hey, I've got so much value. You can't kill me right now. And every turn or every single moment you give me to keep playing is another moment where you're going to be unable to catch up. Yeah. I think a lot of a lot of the ways that people chain cards together, if you if you, they assemble an engine where they they have a, a comic guide and a sack outlet, and uh, there's so many ways that you can add free cards together and get a, a, a an infinite thing going. And usually, it doesn't take much to stop that little engine. Right. Just one piece of it being removed at the exact right time is often enough to set that player back. Yes. A whole turn. Yeah. Um, yes. there's, there's alternate win cons as well and another shout out to you Jesper you seem to be on a lot of these Thassa's Oracle is a new laboratory maniac yeah. that everyone uh, yeah. that caused quite the big scene when it first got announced um, Approach of the yeah. Second Sun as well basically cards that say like you win the game on them are ways to win yeah I tried to convince my playgroup that it's okay that I do Tessa's Oracle and Demonic Consultation because I painted Tessa's Oracle but they're still a little bit hesitant about giving the green light to that kind of <laughs> kind of devious behavior <laughs> <laughs> i can understand why yeah i mean if i ever get yeah. to design a card and it wins me the game on the spot i'm certainly playing it so <laughs> <laughs> um and then a new uh, way of winning that has sort of been more popularized recently i would say josh you've actually had a fair hand in helping this out which is just big damage making the game go faster oh, yeah. through cards like torbran thane of red fell which adds two damage to each uh, every time you have a red source that deals damage fire emancipation does 3x damage mm. Josh built an Obosh, the Prey Piercer deck, uh, and then there's also Neheb the Eternal, which is a, a deck that I love running. And this is just about ending mm. the game really quickly, but also being able to ramp out fast and get ahead of opponents and then say, like, all right, can you deal with all this damage I'm putting out? Uh, and, of course, the yeah. last final win con is Commander Damage, the common one, but probably more uncommon these days than anything else. <laughs> Wait, the common one? <laughs> well, that's why it's at the end of the list. When's the last time you died to Commander Damage? I think this is the theoretical one. Is yeah, that, yeah it's, there you go. It's theoretically yeah. possible, but it actually never happens. Right. Every right. once in a while, a player no. in a game gets knocked out by Commander Damage, but you almost never see <laughs> Commander Damage be the like deciding factor in the victory. Yeah, sometimes it puts just a little bit yeah. of pressure on them to be like, okay, I have to react to that, otherwise I will die to it. Like the Swift Foot Boots moment uh, in in the Game Nights episode, right. but in general, you're right. It's it's not terribly common, but it is still a win con. Yeah. All right. Uh, so how how do we stop the opponent from winning with so many different ways that they could possibly try to win? Right. That seems difficult. Mm-hmm. It's not like I know exactly what they're going to do and they can stop it. It's like they they can do a million different things. So how do you get ready mm-hmm. for that? <clears throat> Well, the number one way that I wrote down, which I thought is a little cheeky, and I'm sorry, but it is to just win yourself. And I'm being absolutely serious here. A lot of times games do come down to this thing where it's like two players, maybe even three players are primed to win. And if you can win before they do, you have effectively stopped them from winning. It's a little reductive, but you know, a lot of times you're trying to gauge the odds when you're setting up for your win condition, right? If you set your board up to win and then pass the turn, that's often a really big mistake. And yes, but this is something that you brought up as well, which is 
is it healthy or wise to tap out, set up your win condition and saying, if nothing happens in the next three turns, then I can win? Yeah, but uh, that was one of the reasons why I, I started discussing this with you guys is that I had a lot of plays where one of my friends would, would set up uh, an enormous board state. He would tap out for Syndica's resurgent and with the board state he had, we all knew he was going to be able to win if it came around to his turn again. But it's also a very bold move because there's free players that sees the danger and are able to respond to it. And usually it wouldn't be that bad because uh, on the rotation of free, we would have gotten rid of Syndicate's Resurgent. Actually, it, I noticed that if, if you had a nature's claim and you would, would just destroy it, then you have basically time walked that guy. He spent seven mana on nothing. Mm -hmm. And that kind of uh, made me think about being a more uh, reactive player rather than being a board state player, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. And that's actually something I think a lot of people could take note of, which is be more reactive than a focus on what you have on your board. Because there's a lot more power, as we know, with the cards in your hand at instant speed. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the reasons I love Vidal Canori so much. Right. Right. Because it allows you to play everything reactionary, even Zendikar Resurgent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of mana though. <laughs> yeah, but I mean if you if you have if you have Vidalgan Ori out, you're just holding all your mana up all the time. So if you ever see a window, yeah. you just stick Z Zendikar Resurgent and go, okay, well now I'm gonna win. <laughs> now I got the yeah, yeah. the most powerful card <laughs> in my deck. But I think it I think it's it comes down to uh change for me at least, it came down to changing my playstyle a little bit. It came down to me trying to not show how I was going to win by deploying all my weapons on the board, but instead keeping a little bit back and not deploying my threats until I was actually able to win. And that meant I had to change a lot of cards to be able to be a more instant and more reactive player. And, and I, I ended up really liking that kind of play style. Yeah. It's either going to be better for you to try and sprint and win or to try and trip everybody else. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. And you have to sort of determine that's what the gauging of the odds is. If we're sprinting to the finish line, am I going to win that race? And if I'm not, then I probably should be in the tripping mode. Right, right. To stop them. Like, in, for instance, cards like Teferi's Protection or Heroic Intervention. Veil of Summer is this brand new card that is just... Brand new, but... Yeah. Well, yeah, like a year old. <laughs> but these are cards that basically are saying, hey, you know what? If I can't win, there's something I can do to disrupt their plan. Right. Like, for, if you know someone's yeah. going to go infinite with Kiki Jiki and Zealous Conscripts, then Teferi's Protection just gives you an entirely new turn to say, hey, you can't even swing out at me and that turn that you're trying to win. I'm going to come back and I'm going to do something about it. So there's a lot of power there as well. Sure. All right, let's move into the, what the next category, and this is what you were speaking to yesterday, I think, which is a, a, a good way to stop your opponent from winning is to play at instant speed. Right. Um, yes. Because it's very, it's way harder to stop them when you're stuck at sorcery speed. It, to, uh, the card that made me change my style the most is uh, the card Decimate. Where oh, yeah, you can I remove a, 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 a yeah, you can move, remove a creature, a land, an enchantment, and what else is that? A uh, land, enchantment, four, and creature, four. artifact, artifact. Yeah, yeah. It seems great because it's sometimes four mana to get rid of four things. It seems super great, but it's so. Uh, first of all, it's sorcery speed. Yep. And second of all, sometimes it's a dead card because there's only three of the four targets. Right. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you, for, to be able to play it, you have to target one of your own things, and that hurts. But uh, I, st I always loved that card. But I started taking it out and adding Nature's Claim instead. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Nature's Claim actually, because this is a card that I think we're going to mention another probably twenty times before this episode is out. So I'll read it. It's just green for an instant. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. Its controller gains four life. I know a lot of new players are going to see this and compare it to Decimate and go, all right, one mana for one thing or four mana for four things. I'm obviously going to take the four mana option. What has pivoted you towards Nature's Claim over and over again? It's the versatility of it. Uh, the Nature's Claim is an instant removal that will stop an opponent uh, from going off with a mana doppler or, or a crucial artifact for his free card combo. Whereas Decimate is just a dead card in an instant uh, mode where you want to stop someone in, in, in not your turn, what is in, in his turn or her turn. I just think the, uh, and the best thing about Nature's Claim is that you can still play a free car card, free cost card and keep one mana open. With Decimate, you're just 
you're tapping out in turn four, right? Yeah, having Nature's Claim just be one mana, we often talk about how great Path to Exile is or Swords to Plowshares, just because, you, like you said, if you have five mana, you can play four mana worth of spells, hold open that one mana, and just have so many options when the table goes around to stop or disrupt something without sort of dampening your own plan because you weren't able to develop your board out as well. I also think, like, what are the situations where Decimate's going to save you from dying, but uh, Nature's right. Claim yeah. won't? Right? Like, how yeah. often is you're like, well, I'm dead to this enchantment, but I'm also dead to this artifact, and I'm also dead to this creature. <laughs> right? Usually any moment yeah. where you're going to be dead to something, it's going to be a singular thing. Right. And if you get rid of it, you will then live. And sure, I would like to get mm. rid of that artifact or that creature too, but that's the gravy part. I really just don't want to die. Nature's Claim is really mm. good at saving you from dying because it's easy to hold one mana open, and it's basically going to save you in the same situations as Decimate for one mana at instant speed, whereas Decimate won't save you at all if they go off on their turn, right? So, yeah, yeah, I basically yeah. never play Decimate because four mana is just too much, even though, yeah, the value is a little bit higher. I'd rather just, yeah. yeah, it's just so hard to hold open four mana. And then, like you said, even then, even if you could do that, sometimes it would still just not have targets. Yep. And it has to still could, be at sorcery yeah. speed for the most yeah. part. Yeah. So it definitely is just a bit of a but damper. We all, we all played Decimate. We all <laughs> back in the day, yeah. yeah. And say, wow, this is insane. But uh, it's, it's just not as good as Nature's Claim when it comes down to changing your play style this way that that we are talking about yeah and i think a lot of uh, a common mistake that newer players will make and this is something that we all were victim to which is you only start judging cards on their best case scenario as opposed to seeing it as a oh, whole yeah. and understanding oh you yeah, know what when right. this card doesn't work it's actually it would have been better just to even have a land in my hand at that point usually when when people we talked about how people usually win by chaining cards together usually in a full game of commander there's one or two moments in a game where the game is decided where an opponent will do some crazy shenanigans and pull cards together and everything seems like likely to explode mm. i only often find it to be one or two uh, instance in a in a game of commander right so you only need to stop one thing and you don't need to stop it fast and you only need to stop it with a nature's claim usually that's why i think that card is so fantastic that one or chain of vapor or instant cards that will just just stop one card this exact moment and 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 that's all you need yeah yeah i, I think players shy away from something like chain of vapor because they look at the downside which is it bounces it right it doesn't get rid of it but most of the time like you said if you're going to lose to the thing, the fact that it bounces back to their hand is immaterial to you. What's really important is that you stopped it. You're not dying. You get another untapped step. Yeah. You get another chance now yeah. to either win yourself or get really ready for the fact that you know absolutely they can win because you know that card that you just put back in their hand. But you didn't die. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and not to mention, you may also have two other players at the table who all go, oh, we all need to prepare for this imminent <laughs> doomsday and get rid of it. Yeah. Um, now, a couple other ways to play at instant speed. Uh, cards like Rune of the Hidden Realm pair really well because it's an activated ability on a creature, and that is able to disrupt stuff in instant speed. I've seen that happen multiple times with Josh's deck where you're like, all right, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go, oh, shoot. He has three or four ways just on his board and untapped mana. Mm. I really can't jump yeah. into this and try and win the game just because there's a sort of a soft lock on just the potential that my opponent can do something to disrupt what I'm trying to do here. Um, cards like Kenrith oh, yeah. as well, Zakama, uh, Thrasios, like you said, and Golos uh, are all ways, again, that have the ability to do something at instant speed. Although Golos is obviously on the higher on the mana cost side. But again, just being able to hold that up as well as cards in your hand means that you now have multiple options and multiple ways that opponents need to be afraid of if they're going to try and win in front of you. Um, counter spells I, as I, Oh, yeah, go for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, after after I started thinking about this, I built a deck with Marath. Uh, oh, Will of the Wild, yeah. And he, yeah, and he or she, I don't know which one it is, is able to to do multiple things. One of them is shooting damage. So having mana open with that commander always give me an ability to shoot down pingers. Mm. But I also did something like uh, playing an Academy Rector having mana open and passing the turn and the moment before it's my turn, shooting my own Academy Rector, putting uh, Syndica Resurgeon into play, <laughs> and then we are good to go. See, that card gets way I mean, better it, if you play it at instant speed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, exactly. 
but uh, I like the, I like the versatility of a commander that has an activation cost that can be used in so many different ways. Right. It also just makes it scary for your opponent. They see the commander, they see the open mana, and they're like, okay, like let's say you have Golos. Do they even try to yeah. really go for it? Because they don't know yeah. if you activate even like even if they assume you don't have anything in your hand. Still, they have to deal with what's on top of your deck, and it could easily be something that thwarts whatever you know plan they have. So, do I really want to tap nine mana for an expropriate here? Right. Yeah, it's risky. It just makes things risky for them. Yeah. So that yeah. that can make people a little bit gun shy or wait for a better moment, which just might give you enough time to win yourself. And sometimes it's just the threat of it is enough. Yep. Yep. You you can sometimes you can just hint at stuff that you can do even though you are packing five lands in your hand. Yeah, actually, you know, thinking about threatening counter spells are so powerful because in one of the most recent game nights episodes where I played Kalia, I had to change my entire sequence of events just because Josh had two blue mana open. I was like, all right, well, I got to oh, run yeah. out of Grand Abolisher first to protect my turn because this is the safest, cheapest play I can make. But that still cost me two yeah. mana and basically changed my entire game plan. So counter spelling, just having flash speed with a Vidalcan Ori or an Alchemist Refuge, cards like Elsha of the Infinite are all ways to just make sure that opponents are not going to be you know, as cer- certain or secure moving into their turn because you have those up. And then like you said, better commanders, yeah. Marath, Isan, Captain Sisse. These are all commanders that have the ability to work and move at instant speed and thus immediately just on the board become a threat in and of them themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's move on to one that I think is very much in your uh, new play style here, which is just a lower mana curve. We've talked about Nature's Claim. Yeah. Um, now, Josh and I are two players that are probably not so hot on the card like Misdirection, but and it, yeah. this seems like a card that is something that definitely is a little more interesting to you. So I'll read it for everyone. It's three blue blue for an instant. It says, you may exile a blue card from your hand rather than pay this spell's mana cost. Change the target of a target spell with a single target. Now, we've talked about it a lot as to why we're not huge fans of this card, but Jesper, I think you actually have a differing opinion here. Yeah, uh, uh, I like cards that can be played uh, uh, without any mana, even though the disadvantage is discarding a card. And the reason is that people usually don't think it's possible. Mm. If you already used your force of will, then people feel safe. So then they will try to do what their deck is supposed to do and, and how they will win. And then you have a, 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 a wrench in their wheel or you have an able, you have ability to stop them. I had a, a friend who always loved to take a lot of turns and play a lot of uh, extra turn spells. And uh, in my Rashmi deck, I started packing Misdirection. <laughs> I, I packed Misdirection because I wanted to be able to uh, save Rashmi in case somebody wanted to cast Source to Plowshare on it. Right. But in this instant, he was playing Time Warp uh, in his Edric deck, trying to go off and take an extra turn with all his weenies, and he would definitely win. But I just changed that extra turn to me instead. <laughs> I have never, se- I've never seen anyone's will to live to live drain away from his face <laughs> like that, and and it's it's the best feeling ever. And of course, have, having two turns, I won that game afterwards. And he was a broken man. <laughs> broken. It's a little window into Jesper's, uh, yeah. into Jesper's mind there. Uh, and of course, there are new cards like the Force of uh, Vigor and Deflecting Swat, the cards you can play for free oh, if your yeah, commander's yeah. out. Those are, I think, just auto-includes in so many decks because of the utility, yeah. right? If you can surprise someone out of nowhere with a card like that. And I don't know how many times where I'm like, I know Josh isn't playing Force of Will in this deck. All right, I'll play this out. But it's like, oh, but he does play Pact of Negation or he does play Deflecting Mm. Swat. So you're just caught in this situation where you have to now account for a whole list of cards even when they have no mana open, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I like Deflecting Swat a lot more than Misdirection. I find that that, uh, little writer clause of uh, on Misdirection, it says of a spell that has a single target right? to just too often be make it hard to use whereas deflecting swat you can change all the targets on the spell yeah um, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I used to play in misdirection quite a bit and just had too many times where it just didn't do what i wanted it to do but i do agree yeah. zero or really low cost stuff is you know Ex- extremely yeah. important like you said with nature's claim the difference between holding open three mana and one mana is ginormous yeah but i think uh, jo- josh you just need to to take away someone's will to live once <laughs> And you will. I've stolen. You I've will, stolen you will, the time stretch be, you will, before. Yeah, it does. It feels great. Don't get me wrong. It feels great for you. Yeah. It feels awful for the other person. And then everyone at the table is like, "Yay! I think that's good." But yeah. now it's bad because you have all those. Turns. Yeah, because now you just win. Yeah, yeah, no one's really happy in that case. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of nature's claim, there's a whole 
slew of cards that basically fit that same mold, which is they're cheap, maybe not free. Usually they're like one mana. And they seem to yeah. have like a major downside. Or a limitation. Yeah. yeah. So Nature's Claim, it's the yeah. it's the life gain, which obviously we don't care about that much in Commander. Uh, because you, four life just usually doesn't matter towards like who's going to win the game in the end. Uh, one of our favorites on the show we've talked about for years is Swan Song, right. which is a counter spell. It's a mm. little narrow in what it can counter, and it also gives that opponent a 2-2 flyer. But both of those things yeah. tend to be totally fine because most of the stuff you want to counter, it can, and also the 2-2 flyer just doesn't tend to matter that much. Yeah, it's way more important to counter a Zenikar Resurgent for yeah. one mana and give them a 2-2 rather than just have that land on the board. Right. Um, Defile is a newer card from Modern Horizons. It's minus one, minus one to a target creature until end of turn for each swamp you control. So it's a little bit more limited in mm -hmm. what you can do with it, but this card gets around indestructible, it gets around so much, and just for one black mana in a mono black deck, or even a two-color deck can do a lot of damage. Pongify is the blue destroyed creature. It gives him an ape. Yeah, I started in including Echoing Truth in decks that uh, have blue also. Ah. Echoing Truth, uh, re re just return a non-land permanent, but that's very versatile. So I started switching out Chaos Warp for Echoing Truth instead because Echoing Truth can be devastating against someone with a token technique mm -hmm. ah, because it right, returns right. all with the same name. And of course, and Chain of Vapor, which you talked about earlier, which yeah, is yeah. a bounce spell for an on-land permanent, but it has the downside that that permanent's controller may sacrifice a land. If the player does, they mm -hmm. may copy this spell and may choose a new target for that copy. So if they want to sack a land, they can bounce something of yours or somebody else's. Uh, yes, where have you ever seen mm -hmm. anybody sacrifice a land to Chain of Vapor? Never. <laughs> Actually, never. But I, I have used it on one of my own... Um, Permanence, ah. and then myself, myself paid the the disadvantage and bounced another thing. Oh, nice! And that's that's even versatile with that card actually that I like. Yeah, it's also important to yeah. pay attention. A lot of cards these days will say bounce target non land permanent that an opponent controls, right. uh, and Chain of Vapor yeah, does not yeah. say that. So it is interesting, right? If you want to yes. rebuy a card. Um, and then a great way to lower the mana curve, uh, one that we saw to great effect again with Josh's Scarab uh, God deck, which is Training Grounds or cards like Biomancer's Familiar. Um, Josh, how much mana... So these are cost reducers? Yeah, cost reducers. Yeah, Training Grounds, by the way, it's blue for an enchantment. Activated abilities of creatures you control cost up two less to activate. This effect can't reduce the mana that cost to less than one mana. Josh, you activated your mm -hmm. Scarab God. I don't even know how many times. Yeah, I think it game. was seven to eight times. So I saved about 16 mana from the 16 training ground. 16 yeah. mana from one card that costs a blue mana. That is a rate that will 100% give you that value engine that is going to be just better than your opponents and just override them with, with what you're able to generate off mm. of it. So definitely never count those cards out. They are so good in the right instances and with the right commanders. All right, we are going to move on and talk about more ways to stop your opponents from winning, including ways to up your card draw in a very, very fun way. But before that, we're going to hear a message from our mid-roll sponsors. I see you've made some serious changes to your deck. This is looking pretty spicy. Yeah, I had a little bit of extra cash because I bought these new Raycon earbuds, so I used the money to get some upgrades for the next Commander night. Wait a second, how did buying a new pair of Raycons leave you with extra cash? Because they're about half the price of other premium wireless earbuds on the market, so I saved a bundle. Ah, makes sense. And unlike some of the other wireless options, Raycon earbuds are both stylish and discreet with no dangling wires or stems to distract you as you're listening. Yeah, totally. I got their newest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds. They're the best ones yet, with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a compact design that gives a nice noise isolating fit. So now's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon and get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash command. That's buyraycon.com slash command and get 15% off of Raycon wireless earbuds. Once again, buyraycon.com slash command. All right, now that your deck is upgraded, wanna get in a quick game? Yeah, let's do it. What deck is that? Kozilek. Actually, you know what? I just remembered I have something to take care of. Far from here. Goodbye. Oh, okay. Bye. You know, it must have been pretty tough for Bruce Tarl. Yeah. I mean, herding all those oxen so boorishly in such a tough environment, that is not easy work. Oh, no. I mean, yeah, I'm sure that was hard. I'm talking about the fact that he lost all of his hair. Oh, <laughs> right. Well, you know, for us guys, a lot of our identity is wrapped up in our hair, and that couldn't have been easy on old Bruce here. It's too bad he didn't know about keeps. 
the simple and easy way to keep your hair. Yeah, totally. The best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair left. And Keeps treatments typically take between four and six months to see results, so it's important to act fast. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you're going to save. Plus, with Keeps, you don't have to visit a doctor's office or wait in line at the pharmacy. You can talk to an expert online and get medication delivered right to your home or your field of oxen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very convenient. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash command and receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash command. You know, one good thing, Bruce didn't have any hair loss in the mustache area. Yeah, no kidding. Arrgh. What was that? That's my ox bellow. I see. Bruce. <laughs> Maybe they, that's what they sound like. <laughs> All right, we're back. We have special guest MTG artist Jesper Ising talking with us about stopping your Woo! opponent from winning. The next category is one that's near and dear to my heart. All of our hearts, I guess. It's highly efficient card draw. Right. Yes. This so, is definitely a Jesper favorite as well. Yeah, I like the point yes. that you made to us here, Jesper, about if you have a lower mana curve, then you're likely to empty your hand faster. So what does that mean? Hey, I noticed that if you if you... It's a good example is I started switching out Cultivate and Kodama's Reach for Rampant Growth and Far Seek, for example. Mm -hmm. So lowering my curve from three to two, all of that just meant that I would have emptied most of my hand around turn three or four. So I needed to rebuild up to seven very quickly. And uh, cards that I like to do that is, of course, Wheel of Fortune mm -hmm. or all the other wheel effects, uh, like Windfall. Windfall. Yep. Uh, time twister, if you have that. Uh, <laughs> Not many people uh, do. Yeah, yeah. I, I personally no, don't. No, but, <laughs> I mean, Wheel of Fortune is so good. I think people don't correctly evaluate it as a card draw card. I basically, I don't have unlimited Wheel of Fortunes, but if I did, I would put it in every deck that has red, regardless of what other colors were there. Because of the fact yeah. that you discard your hand, but then you draw back up to seven cards. Yep. And I think yeah. people always want to wait till they have no cards in hand, but the correct way to play that card is often, oh, I have three cards left, cast Wheel of Fortune, because that's three mana, draw three cards. It's totally fine. Or sorry, yeah. draw four cards. Yeah, four it's cards. It's totally fine. And then, yeah, of course, if in some instances you draw more than that, but you don't have to like, you don't have to get seven cards out of it for it to be good. Even if you get three, it actually can be good. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think like, Wheel of Fortune, if maybe you don't think it's that great, I don't. maybe you're not playing it right. Maybe you're only trying to play it when you're going to get six or seven cards. Three or four cards can be fine. Yeah, and in general, right, like the best rate you can ask for in card draw and magic, I usually try to say, if you can reduce your rate of card draw for that, so that's one mana is equal to one card, then you're getting one of the best rates in the game. So a card like Painful Truths will draw you three cards for three mana. Wheel of Fortune oftentimes gets way better than this. If you have two cards in hand and Wheel of Fortune's one of them, you're actually drawing six cards for three mana so you're getting for one mana you're getting two cards and that's that's like absolutely some of the best rates you can ever get in the game that's why cards like Ristic study or guardian project are so good over the long term because i've had games where Ristic study has drawn me what eight nine cards and that means for one mana i'm drawing three cards off a rate of that card now it's obviously not all in one turn but that still is better than any blue card draw spell out there with the exception of you know <laughs> one mana draw three yeah, ancestral <laughs> yeah. recall. Ancestral recall, yeah, which is <laughs> obviously not, legal, not legal, yeah. So again, like if that's the absolute best rate and it's been banned, Wheel of Fortune, if you're casting it with three, even two cards in hand, you're going to be getting a rate that's similar to that. So that's, I think, how people should be evaluating that card. Not to mention, you can disrupt your opponents. Exactly, and you can fill your graveyard with the stuff yep. that you have in your hand. Yep. Uh, I mean, the, one of my favorite part is if, if you can drop a one mana uh, artifact in turn one or a mana dog in turn one you can add a another kind of ramp in turn two and then you, you immediately wheel a fortune in turn three mm -hmm. you're disrupting the opponent enormously and it doesn't matter that you're losing a couple of cards you you're gaining seven and destroying uh, the hand of the opponent I think that's a good, fair trade, actually. Yeah, I, I think so, too. And, like, definitely don't discount the fact that, you know, I've had so many games where I'm looking, all right, turn four and five, I'm really going to be able to get going with my hand. A Wheel of Fortune, any time before that, completely disrupts my plans. It changes the way I sequence my cards. And oftentimes would just put me so far behind that I don't have a realistic chance of getting back in the game unless I really top deck into something nice. I, I mean, a funny thing yeah. you can also do is if you can pull off a turn two Wheel of Fortune, like you play turn Sorry. one Birds of Paradise or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. You can mana screw your opponents because it's like a forced mulligan that they right. can't mulligan out of. Yeah. Wow. So like yeah. you can definitely like just 
like they played their one land you went you went first or before them and then you you mold them into a hand that maybe has no lands or only has one land and or all, has all lands right yeah, yeah. exactly so, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of ways you can mess with your opponents that's a fun thing to do yeah yes <laughs> but i think uh, to get to get back to it i mean if if you're lowering the curve you need more than windfall and wheel of fortune you need also need r- rustic study and right. Right. other ways that will net your cards uh, runic amasawa is a fantastic card i found oh, recently right. That that will just uh, slowly fill your hand, but also I try to think of my commander if if it, that could be a card advantage card too. Mm-hmm. My favorite deck is Omnet of the Royal, and he has a built-in card draw engine that s- starts rolling when he's over eight mana. So I think also uh, thinking about what your commander can do to to refill your hand is very important. Right. And in talking about all of this, Jesper, you mentioned that thinking about cards differently like this, thinking about lowering your mana curve and in general has created a change in your overall play style. Can you tell the viewers yeah. what your play style was before you sort of had these Melissa de Toro revelations and into what your play style has evolved to as a result? Yeah, I mean, uh, before that, I was into big board states, a lot of token uh, strategies and a lot of big plays. Um and it was fun when it happened, but most of the time I found that I had a winning hand in my hand and I was able to do it if it came around to my turn and then somebody else would win and I would kind of feel bad. That's why I started lowering the curve to like really lowering it so that the, the main part of my deck now is around cost two or three. Wow. I start, I look at cards now and think I will not include anything that cost over five mana unless it have a major impact on the game the moment it hits and that's usually a sun titan that i will include because that has a very good impact on a game yeah it it does something when it comes down it's a really really good card if it lives it's even better (laughs) but after that i I don't see many cards that uh, has a potential in my deck because they will be too dangerous to spend seven or eight mana to cast and then get countered so I would rather be, I look at a card now and I think, does this have an impact the moment it, it, it comes into play? Or is it good on its own? Or is it good together with other cards? If it's not a good card on its own in any circumstance, I'll try not to include it. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Well, speaking of the mana difference, if you're saying you're not going above three, I wanted to ask a couple of questions to the, uh, the quorum here. If you had to choose between Path to Exile, which only gets rid of a creature, versus a card like Anguished Unmaking, and the assumption is that you're able to play both these cards in your deck, which you're would you Orzhov. choose? Yeah, you're, you're an Orzhov or more. Which of those two would you choose if you could only have one? So Anguished Unmaking, Exile is a target non land permanent, and you lose three life. Path to Exile, Exile is a creature, and the opponent can put a basic land into play tapped. Yeah, it's pretty difficult. I would like to have both, but you say I can only pick one? <laughs> I like the versatility of the the dual color card, but uh, I still would l- rather go with the one cost because the scenario where somebody is trying to win and kill me with a berserk dragon uh, and I have one white mana open, that's that's a perfect blowout. Mm-hmm. If if someone is want, want to kill me and I have one mana open, I can stop it. If I need to keep three mana, so mana open to be able to stop it, then I'm... I'm hindered too much in my my board state and gameplay and whatever I want to do in my, in the game, and I think that's the most important thing is that I don't want to be be stopped in what I'm doing to try to win. I will just usually just have one or two mana open so I can stop anyone if they're trying to win before me and vindicate or what? What did you say the other one? Anguish was? they're making, but vindicate similar as well. Angu- yeah, I think that a little bit too expensive casting cost wise for what they're doing because what i want to do is just stop one thing quickly right you'd rather have a nature's claim that's a artifact or enchantment rather than something that's target non-land permanent yeah yeah um how about a card like oblivion stone this is a three mana artifact that you can pay for to tap it to put a fate counter on target permanent but more importantly you can pay five and tap it to sack it and destroy each non-land permanent without a fate counter on it and then you remove all the fate counters from all permanents so it's a cheaper artifact it's three mana however it's a board wipe effect that costs five to do afterwards do you typically find that having this sort of effect on your board Jesper, is something that you'd like to do with this new play style of yours I never played that card, actually. Uh, I never played it because I think usually I don't want to destroy everything because I will have artifacts that I rely on 
or I will have an enchantment like Rhystic Study, mm -hmm. and I don't want to mess with that. I would rather have a pinpoint card that can stop things than having a wide board clear. I mean, it's great because we love the differing opinions. We're usually the advocates of, you know, five single target removal, five board wipes. But yeah, do you case, not play Wraths at all? Yeah, but I play the red one, the one that uh, gives 13 damage, and you can Blasphemous usually play Act, for yeah. one red mana. Yeah, I play Blasphemous Act, and I play Toxic Deluge. Because they're cheap. And I play yeah. uh, uh, Cyclonic Rift. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, O-Stone is expensive, right? If you wanted to play it and activate it on the same turn, that's eight mana. It's a lot. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you're playing it and then hoping that it's still around by the time it gets back to your turn, and usually that either doesn't happen, or everyone says, well, I'm going to just attack you until you light that thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't I don't play O-Stone much anymore, do you? No, I, I rarely do. And like Jesper said, oftentimes you have so much stuff on your own side of the board, and the magic Christmas land scenario that you're going to somehow put fake counters on your stuff before someone gets rid of your O-Stone, mm. it's just not going to happen, and you're just going to waste a ton of mana. Yeah, I usually have it in my Tim deck because yeah. it can untap things, and even there I found like it was very unlikely I was going to be able to protect enough stuff to make it worth it, and I just took it out. Just tons of mana they yeah. sink yeah. into it, yeah. yeah. Um, now, obviously we've been talking about all these low CMC spells, but I think a lot of players are still very much entranced by what I would call the massive swing board wipes, which is another way to stop your opponents yeah. from winning. So cards like Austere mm. Command, uh, Bane of Progress, or Dismantling Wave are cards that are saying, get rid of everything of this one type. So in a way, it's a bit more pinpoint. Mm. But yes, but these cards cost six mana and up. How do you feel about them? I think we know the answer, but I still want to hear it. Yeah, I mean, I like Auster Command because you can choose what's best for you. You can choose the option. And usually you can pack that in, in a deck like my uh, Hate Bear deck. And I can kill all the high power creature and my bears will survive. I like the versatility of that. But usually I don't want to wipe boards. I want to keep the stuff I played and I want to make it difficult for other people to get access to their card, in a hate bear deck at least. But I think six six mana, if you compare Oster Command with Toxic Deluge, right. right? Toxic Deluge is just so much better and it will take care of all the creatures. Usually Oster Command, like we talked about with Decimate, it's it takes care of a lot of things. And in a dream scenario, you will wipe the board from everything troublesome. But, uh, but usually you're just looking at, uh, okay, you're losing a little bit yourself too. And... Yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not worth it, I, right? I, I, I would rather play Wrath Ra of God or, um, or card that are cheaper in the mana cost and does one thing. Right. Um, Vandal Blast, I think, is one card that is one that fits very squarely, right? You like Cyclonic Rift for the same reason, just because it's a card that, one, blows up things that you don't control and you have the versatility of option of either paying one red for it or four in a red to overload it. Um, personally, this is probably one of my favorite cards in Magic now that I think about it just because it has the ability to really disrupt your opponents and slow them down in a way that I think Jesper, you would approve of, which is stopping the ramp or whatever it is. I like that card too, but I recently started switching it out for a braid. Oh, a braid. Because uh, the one you're talking about is a sorcery. And a braid is an instant. Right. A, a braid will deal free damage to target creature, which is often very, very important. Or it can destroy an artifact. So I know it's way worse than what, what's your card again? Oh, Vandal, Vandal Blast. Blast. Yeah, the full effect of Vandal, Vandal Blast. Blast right. so, sorry. Uh, but I've, I just think a braid, for me, it's, it's more versatile in what I want to do. Yeah, that uh -huh. seems nuts to me. Vandal Blast, I think, is just so good. I put it in every deck with red in it because the, the option of one red mana to destroy an artifact. There's almost never a game where you're not fine doing that. And because it's so cheap at sorcery speed, I'm fine with it. And then often you can just yeah, yeah. totally win a game off the back of the overload. Right. Because all the decks that don't yeah. have green in them are relying on their artifacts for like half their mana. Yeah. So if you stick the overload end, a lot of times you win. Yeah. And we saw that in the in the match we played on extra turn that, Jimmy, you just basically halved my uh, mana producing board with a, <laughs> with a Vandal Blast and I was... I was sure I was going to die after that. Turns out it didn't actually matter, though. I mean, it mattered. That's not as much as... It, uh, it yeah. mattered a lot. Not game-ending mattering. Yeah. But, but I, I started just changing it for uh, for a braid or for the card wear and tear. Ah, because right. those are cheap and they're instants. And I, I like that a little bit better. Or maybe it's something I need to test and come back to uh, and see if it works. Yeah, we'd love to know your thoughts. And I, I think this is something for the audience as well to think about, right? Would you rather run cards like Wear and Tear and a Braid over a card like Vandal Blast? In this case, it seems like the instant speed versus sorcery is really the big differentiator here. 
Maybe yeah. because I play Vidal Canori in all my decks, the Battle Blast is <laughs> off sometimes an instant for me. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> all right, let's move on to the next category, and this is the obviously the more controversial one, uh, but we'll call it stacks as in or or hate bear stacks slash anti strategy or slowing your opponents down. This is the one that we saw most in play again in extra turns with your new deck. Uh, the anti strategy yeah. category has cards like Torpor Orb, which says creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. Pithing Needle, which specifically affects one thing. Linvala, Keeper of Silence, which stops activated abilities of, com- of your creatures your opponents control. And, of course, the Stony Silence and the Graph Diggers Cages type cards. Uh, are you a big fan of Torpor Orb and these sorts of cards, Jesper? Or do you find that because they also affect you, you'd rather not play them? Yeah, I, I look at them. I, I constantly want to try to put them in decks. And I look at them and, and evaluate if it's going to hurt me too much. And usually it will hurt me too much. But Linvala, Keeper of Silence, never hurts you. It's just a one-sided disruptor for the for the opponents. Right. So I'm, I'm like, in Linvala is the perfect card. But uh, card, I think cards like uh, we talked about, uh, Rest in Peace, mm-hmm. that's one of the cards that I had have my decks completely destroyed if an opponent played that card and i started thinking i i'm gonna play that card too because it's <laughs> it's amazing amazing what it can do yeah if you can't um, beat them join them right but i think <laughs> i think it's constantly an evaluation between is this hurting me a lot or can i play around it and if you can play around it and hurt your opponents really bad then it might be worth the inclusion i think yeah one i like quite a bit is graph diggers cage it's one mana that's one of the reasons I like it. For mm. an artifact, it says creature cards in mm. graveyards and libraries can't enter the battlefield and players can't cast spells from graveyards or libraries. Because I'm not a big graveyard player myself generally. Right. And so most of my decks are just like, yeah, it, it might be mildly inconvenient for me. Every once in a while, I might have a Snapcaster Mage or something. But in general, it's going to hurt other players a lot. Because there's almost always one dedicated graveyard deck at the table and then everybody else is likely to have certain graveyard interacting cards or f- flashback cards or whatnot yeah so yeah yeah it can just be a silver bullet that only injures you a little bit yeah but totally te- decimates a deck or if you're playing boros it might not hurt you at all yeah exactly oh right yeah it's just a card you put in and you uh, you don't play it if it doesn't matter but when it matters it matters big time right right i think a lot of times players think that oh because i'm boros i need to make sure that i'm making up for the deficits but they don't think about cards like graph digger's cage which is just like actually maybe a big way that you fight back is by stopping other players and putting them pulling them yeah. down to your b- sort of playing field which is sort of what you're describing with your hate bears deck as well you know it's sort of saying yeah. like what what is yeah. my what can't my colors do? They literally can't do this thing. So can I just turn that off for everybody then? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is a card slot, but it, it sometimes again will completely hose another deck. And one card doing that much damage, let's say it's one card that affects 30 cards in an opponent's deck, that's better than any card in the history of Magic the Gathering. <laughs> that's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's also some planeswalkers. That- Everyone's least favorite to fairy T3 fairy uh, can, you know, say each opponent can cast spells only anytime they could cast a sorcery. Don't Ooh, like that. Definitely like that. definitely rough for Josh. Don't like that. <laughs> Same with cards like Karn the Great Creator, stops activated abilities of artifacts. Um, oh, and then you know Ashiok Dream Render. Oh, rough. I like Ashiok a lot. Yeah. yeah. This says spells and abilities your opponent's control can't cause your controller to search their library. No so, more tutoring. No more fetching. Yeah. No more yes. fetching. That's insane to me. That you know you could turn off five, six lands in someone's deck, but with just one Planeswalker. No more rampant growth. Yeah. It cultivates. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no more fun times for me. (laughs) There's also, of course, mana stacks, and we saw this to great effect in Extra Turns. No spoilers, but Thorn of Amethyst was played. And you could watch this card almost create like a tidal wave of just like, we all have to now swim through this, or we have to wade through this quicksand to get to where we want to go. And I, th- I thought it was extremely effective. And again, just for two mana, saying non-creature spells cost one more to cast. If you're a creature-based deck, this is incredible in your deck. Yeah, because that was one of the things I was looking at when I created the deck. I have about 40 creatures in that deck. Almost every effect, even counter spells and artifact destruction card is is put onto a creature. Mm-hmm. So I have so many creatures and I'm not hindered by that almost at all. So for me, that was an auto-include. There's probably a lot of people out there that have a deck that has 35 plus creatures. Thorn of Amethyst will be yeah. really good in that deck. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. 
And you'll be surprised, again, similar to like, you know, having a training grounds out, count how much extra mana your opponents have to pay if you do play a card like Throne mm -hmm. of the Van for this. And I think you will be surprised every single time. That, that It could get into the 10s, 20s, even 30s sometimes if the game goes on long enough. And that's a huge, mm -hmm. huge amount of mana advantage you can get over them. I also like something like Thorn of Amethyst because we hear from a lot of people who like maybe they have other people in their play group that play expensive cards and they feel like uh, it's very difficult for me to beat this other player because they just are willing or have the ability to spend more money on magic than I do. Yeah. But cards like Thorn of Amethyst, Stony Silence, Rest in Peace, not expensive cards, totally hose certain decks and a lot mm. of the types of players that are playing with expensive cards are going to play some kind of combo or something that's very effective yes. but they need to play two things in a row thorn of amethyst often just makes it so that's very difficult to do they can't play the three cards in the same turn yeah and so you can defeat those players with a with cards that are a lot cheaper than what they're doing by thinking of it yeah. in terms of like hey rather than try to beat them at their game which is like play these really you know, high power, high power, expensive cards. I can try and stop those cards from being effective for them, which is usually cheaper. Yeah, yeah, I like that a lot, actually. And Josh, that that was a discussion we had recently in my play group. Is that some people have a lot of uh, very old and expensive cards, and some of the other players feel maybe a little bit left behind. I took that to heart and built a mono white, extremely cheap deck, and that deck uh, kind of. At some point, it it uh, completely rules the game just by playing Rule of Law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because Rule of Law is an insanely cheap card that will just... It will take everyone down to White's level. Right, players can't cast more than one spell a turn. You only get to play one spell. <laughs> yeah. You can't cast more than one spell per turn. It doesn't matter how much you've drawn with Rhystic Study. You, you can I, have this, I have this story I like to tell, and I'll do a brief mm. aside here, which is I used to play basketball a lot. Mm. And we used to play like a few times a week. Um, we played at USC at the gym there when I was much younger. And there was this guy, and uh, his name was Henry. And he was really good. Like, he was like... Two inches shorter than me, could just throw down windmill dunk, like super athletic, faster, than, faster than me, stronger than me, mm. shot better than me, dribbled better than me. Everything about Henry was better at basketball than me, but we would have to play this guy all the time, and I'm not trying to figure out a way to beat him. What I discovered was that I could be in better shape than Henry, so that's about all I could beat him at. So I just worked really hard to get in good shape, and then whenever we played against Henry, I would just doggedly stick on him and make him work really hard. And by about the uh. middle of the game, every time we played, he'd be tired. Ah. <laughs> like, I wasn't going to beat Henry by trying to jump higher than him. I wasn't going to beat him by becoming a better shooter than him or, or whatever. Like, that was the way that I found. So don't try and beat the player who's playing the expensive cards at their game. Don't try and play ex more expensive cards than oh, them. Right. Figure out a different angle yeah. of attack. And this can be that, exactly. right? Don't try and beat Henry yeah. by being better at basketball than him. Be like, okay, well... <laughs> There's no way I can ever do that. Yeah, but so. I can just be in better shape than him, and that will be effective enough. And then, uh, well, the funny thing was, after a while, like, Henry just hated playing against me. He would right. see me come on the court, <laughs> and he would just deflate. <laughs> and then I didn't yeah. even have to work that hard after a while because he just wouldn't try that hard in those games. He was just passing more and getting it out Yeah, he just wouldn't be as assertive, and, it, you know, and we would just had, like, an 80% win rate after a while against teams where Henry was playing because he's usually awesome, but, again, right. he would just be like, uh, it's just too much work. I'm just not going to do it. Right, right, you know? right. And nice guy, like, we were friends and everything, but it wasn't like that. But, like, I think that's a really good lesson in life mm. in general and gaming specifically, which is, like, figure out an angle that's going to be in your favor, and it's not usually beating mm. the person at the thing they're already awesome at. Yeah, that's a good point. You took stacks to basketball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Josh created That's his own amazing. anime storyline there. That's amazing. That's like the mid-season breaking point when it's like the, the mind, like, oh my gosh, this yeah. is what I can do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in that but, case, uh, like uh, talking about cards that are, I like to call them annoying but effective, like blind obedience, yeah. artifacts and creatures your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped. That is sometimes yeah. just enough to completely yeah. stop someone in their tracks because they're the type of player that needs to have haste on their turn. They're coming in, they're using all their activated abilities out of nowhere, but now you've literally time walked them with a blind obedience or forced them to change their entire play style to try and get around a cheaper card that anyone has access to. Same with a really? card like Authority of the Consoles, yeah. Blind obedience really good against mana rocks too because you can't tap them the turn they come into play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really slows yeah. people down. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and then of course... I like... 
Oh yeah, go for it. Yes, I right. like all the the eidolons, the creatures, the eidolons that uh, one of them is the same as rule of law, and the other one is uh, you can't draw more than one card per turn. Yeah. Spirit of the labyrinth. Yeah, I like them because it's creatures, so they're they're very easy to tutor up and play and get into play. But they're also very devastating for combo players. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, that's why I don't feel so bad about playing staxy cards. Because uh, what what they essentially do is they make it so that the combo player can't uh, win and cheat. <laughs> <laughs> Makes everybody play fair. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a difference between those type of cards and the stasis and the winter orbs and the static orbs of the world, which are like, yeah. okay, this game is just going to take forever now. I'm not saying I have a stack yeah. stack. I'd barely ever play it. I'm not saying those strategies are invalid or there's not places for them, but I understand why that frustrates people. But Thorn yeah. of Amethyst shouldn't frustrate people very much, right? Yeah, like, almost every color can get rid of artifacts, right? So that's not even a big deal there. Not just that. Like, you still get to play. It's just saying, like, you got to pay one more mana for stuff. So instead right. of, instead of like, playing your two-card combo on the same turn, maybe you can't do that. That seems like a totally fine strategy that nobody should be mad about. Yeah. Yeah. Same with cards like Ghostly Prison and Propaganda that just tax the opponent just a little bit, the tax part of stacks, mm -hmm. without completely shutting them down. And you know, like you said earlier about the creatures too, like the fact that you can tutor out creature hate bearers and get them onto the battlefield a lot easier, more quickly, makes it great because yeah. your opponents can still remove them, but they'll have to use a removal spell. And using it on like a two mana two two often feels so bad compared to the big combo piece or whatever it is. They're a very scary commander that's going to help them win the game, but they're going to have to do it because your one card is sort of slowing down their strategy that makes them completely ineffective. Also, when when we talked about um the way that people win, usually by chaining cards together. Uh, and usually that happens around turn six or eight. So if you can play a card like, let's say, Ethersworn Canonist, that uh, that only you can only cast one more. Um, if it's not an artifact, you can't cast more than one spell per turn. Right. That will usually stop a combo player or it will make the person who's about to win uh, have to get rid of this card before they can win. And usually that little obstacle is enough so that you get a whole turn and you get the ability to be able to win. So this is effectively a card that costs two mana that destroys a whole turn for the opponent. And it's it's a creature. It's easy to tutor up and find and play and still keep mana open so you can win in your turn. Yeah, it's tripping them on the way to the finish line rather than trying to run faster than them yeah uh, we'll do yeah, another sports exactly. comparison here if you guys watch the 100 meter dash you'll notice that there's a scientific process to it how they come off the starting block when they have their acceleration when they hit their max speed and all of that is very carefully planned out and if you at any moment even if it was usain bolt just pushed him a little bit to the left and stopped him from getting in his full stride, you're going to completely wreck their ability to win the game because they're, you know, they're planning on having an uninterrupted sequence of events to be able to do something at their maximum potential. So just that small little trip, don't ever trip a runner, by the way, but just that small obstacle in the way of a player <laughs> that is kind of like that runner trying to get to the 100 meter dash line um, can just, again, completely slow them down and make them restart, right? If, if you say, well, in the middle of his race had to stop and restart from scratch, there's no way he's ever winning a race. <laughs> Actually, he might That's still. A good analogy. Bolt. Yeah, he's pretty fast. <laughs> he's I, pretty yeah. fast. It's a, it, it, like if it's against me, then yes, he wins. Oh, okay, okay. What, if, yeah. what about Henry? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Henry then or Henry now? Oh, Henry's okay, probably okay. like forty now. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Henry probably could still dunk. Yeah, uh, pff, I mean that's insane. If he's shorter than you, he's can't five dunk. seven. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Henry was good. Um, Henry pro probably listens to the show. Henry. Henry. Sorry about all that. <laughs> he's just like ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last stack strategy I want to talk about, the one that probably uh, uh, angers Josh the most, would just be mass land destruction. But not just land destruction, but sometimes cards like Blood Moon. Maybe land denial. Land yes. denial, right? Like, Because MLD is in general frowned upon. Um, do you ever play Blood Moon, Jesper? Is this something that you found effective? Especially against players <laughs> with like really expensive and really uh, extra non-basic mana bases. I play Blood Moon in every deck that has red. <laughs> it's... <laughs> Why, Why did I know that was going to be the answer? <laughs> that 
that deck, it, it's just, uh, that card is the same as uh, Rule of Law. It, it's not the same as Rule of Law. <laughs> it is not the same as Rule of Law. Because there's a certain percentage of decks where it says you're not casting any spells now. Yeah, you're just Rule done. of Law says you're going to be, you're going to only do one thing, but you're going to still do the same amount of stuff as everybody else. What I love about Blood Moon is that it usually uh, makes it difficult for people who play a lot of expensive non-basic lands. Right. So what you should do is just play more basic lands and you're good to go. There's no problem. The problem is it's impossible to make that adjustment during that game. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good point. That's the problem with Blood Moon. Like, I don't mind Armageddon as much because I can play lands right, and restart. after it yeah. happens. Yeah. I mean, usually people play it and then win, which is also fine with Blood Moon, but Blood Moon, they don't. Nobody says, I play Blood Moon, and then I'm going to win the game. Right. That's what uh, how, that's how Armageddon <laughs> is played. Blood Moon is usually played, and then you got to sit there, and it doesn't matter what <laughs> lands I draw now, because they're going to come to play as mountains. And also, by the way, red can't remove enchantments, so I just can never get out of this. Yeah. That's why I hate Blood Moon. <laughs> Armageddon's totally fine. <laughs> but what I love is that the greedy players are the ones that are most annoyed by it. It's the one with all the expensive cards. <laughs> it doesn't have to be expensive lands. I got lands with guild gates in them. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You're shutting down the guild. It's just people who player. like to play a lot of colors. Yeah, there you go. Oftentimes gets in the way of them. That's hilarious. I've had a lot of my... You're a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're not going to talk me out of it. <laughs> I wasn't mad about the hate bears, but Blood Moon? <laughs> blood Moon, yeah. That gets his blood boiling. But it's also because I had I had a Blood Moon played against my five color decks that I know how devastating it is, and that's how I I, I included in my decks because I felt it on my own body. It's another right. reason why Nature's Claim is so good. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because at least you can add the green before the Blood Moon and takes then let effect. it resolve and then get rid of it, <laughs> where you're way more likely to have that green available to you than you would if you had Decimate or something. Which it's too late now for Decimate because uh, by the time it's your turn, they're all mountains. Yeah. But you like to watch people's souls leave their body, Esper, so it makes sense. <laughs> but uh, do you guys play cards like Cataclysm? Uh, rarely. Only if, it, if I have a way to guaranteed win pretty much immediately after resolving it. Because okay. it just feels too bad. Okay. Again, I don't, equi I don't think those cards are similar to Blood Moon. No, no. Blood Moon is totally different in its own class. Maybe Back to Basics is the closest you're going to get. Right. In that it's not played as a game-winning play. And so mm. it takes a player or two, maybe, and says, you got to sit there, and it doesn't matter what you draw. Right. Whereas at least Cataclysm, mm. Armageddon, the rest, I can draw lands, or if I have lands in my hands, I can play them, and I can start to recover. Ruination is also totally fine mm -hmm. for the same reason. But Blood Moon mm. is a different is in a different space, because it's a persistent effect that sits there. And if you can't get rid of it, you're done for. I just think it's bad game design as <laughs> in general, because the type of play, it's either an on switch or an off switch. So it either just doesn't do anything or it just totally like, hey, this one card, guess what? If you weren't ready for it at that exact moment, you just can't beat it. GG. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Guess you always have to be ready for it then, Josh. Whatever. If somebody beats me with blood, most of the time, at least you can be like, all right, I can see. Yeah. Everybody have fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And by the way, that player that played Blood Moon on me, I'm taking out my meanest deck and I'm pointing at you for the rest of the night. <laughs> so that's what you get. But <laughs> But you you just need a chain of vapor and you're good to go. That's the whole point about what where we're going is that Blood Moon is bad. You can destroy it with a Nature's Claim right, or a chain right. of vapor or Echoing Truth. There's a lot to be done with it. Uh, so I don't feel it as devastating. I feel what what the problem is. Cards like that feel mostly annoying when you don't have an answer for them. Mm. So maybe I think the reason is to build your deck with, with cheaper answers. I mean, I play more answers than probably anybody you know. So I, yeah, I think the problem is you have to have the answer now. Yeah, unless you know exactly. Especially if you yeah. get a Blood Moon out turn two, then that's you know exactly. You're not going to have Chain of Vapor oh, like yeah. held open no. on turn two or three most of the time. Maybe now you have to. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll take it out. Then. I'll take them out of the deck. <laughs> Uh, got got him. Got him. <laughs> <laughs> all right moving on to our last sort of area of ways to stop the opponents and this is one that we talk about all the time on the show which is just politics there are obviously ways to get around opponents winning or at least pointing their win condition at you even if it is for one turn learning how to point enemies at each other and not to becoming the active target how to really learn how to threat assess correctly and drive other players to action these are often ways that you can generate 
in infinite value and never have to spend a single mana or card to do so um so when cards yeah. can't solve your in-game problems josh maybe someone else can get rid of that blood moon for you i mean that's what you usually resort to right is asking somebody else begging somebody else offering them stuff you know going back to earlier when you said catch all removal it was like path to exile versus anguish i'm making what would you have if you could only have one yes you said path to exile i agree i think another upside of nature's claim path to exile even chain of vapor maybe to a lesser extent is that don't forget you have the ability to barter with the abilities and effects and cards that you have. So right. often you can be like, oh, hey, yeah. I can get rid of a creature for you. Can you get rid of that thing for me? We can trade. And that turns yeah. your Path to Exile into an enchantment removal spell sometimes. Right. Not all the time because yes. your opponents don't always have what you need or, or care that you can just exile a creature. But some percentage of games, somebody's going to be open to that, which is like, you don't like that creature, right? I'll get rid of that. Can you get rid of this thing for me? Yeah. Yeah. So you that's actually a, another... drew a card with your Path to Exile in the way. Yeah, so that's another way that makes Nature's Claim and Path to Exile and those types of effects a little bit better, maybe. Oh, Whereas I Anguish see. on Making, mm -hmm. you don't need to make that deal. You just cast it on the thing you want to kill, so it doesn't get any better because of politics. I mean, it does in that you can also use it as like, hey, don't attack me, I'll kill that thing. Right. But you can do that with Path too. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like that. I mean, that's one of the things that you guys taught me to be a better political player uh, and not stopping at what I have in my hand, but trying to come up with uh, with uh, friends within the game that can work for me. I really, I really like that aspect of Commander a lot. Yeah, yeah. it's the Henry yeah. thing too, right? It's like, right. okay, well, what do I got yeah. in my hands? What's on the board? All right, well. Yeah. Given that that doesn't solve it, what else do I have access to? Oh, maybe talking to someone. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, if you yeah. want to learn how to talk to someone, you should also listen to our Sun Tzu episodes on the Art of War, Machiavelli, The Prince, World War One, and as well as our Taoism episodes. Uh, it, those are all just sort of, you know, people love them just because they approach the game from a different angle and give players a lot more choices in how to play the game. It's been a while since we did a pol politics episode. We might have to yeah. do one of those again, Renew too. It. Yeah. How to Defeat Blood Moon 101. <laughs> talk yes for out of <laughs> <laughs> it in his deck. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we have some honorable mentions for cards that can stop your opponents from winning. And these are cards that just basically say, you can't lose the game. So Glacial Chasm is a cumulative upkeep land that basically lets you, uh, d creatures you control can't attack, but you prevent all damage that will be dealt to you. A great way to sort of set yourself up before you get rid of it yourself. Platinum Angel, yeah. a classic card that says you can't lose the game and your opponents can't win the game. And then cards like Platinum Imperium where it says your life total can't change. Uh, so, you know, these are, again, just sort of other ways to be like, hey, you know what? I have a silver bullet in my deck that is a creature or isn't necessarily an enchantment or an artifact, but this is a way that I can stop my opponent from winning. Um, and yeah. usually you want to build your deck to take advantage of these cards. You don't want Glacial Chasm out there without a way to get rid of it at instant speed, for instance. <laughs> you, like, you want to be able to get rid of that when you need it to. I love to be able to play a crop rotation on a card and then fetch Chasm on instant speed. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah there you go. Yourself. And save yourself. Usually that's enough to completely wreck the uh, the plan of an opponent. And then you can win in your turn. Right. And that's just, again, it's just one green mana that will allow you to, to do that. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Um, Angel's Grace is a card that you see quite a bit. Oh, right. For this. Oh, I, yeah. I'd, I'd say this is similar to your crop rotation thing. I'd say this is my preferred way to do it. Just because if you have Platinum Empyrean on board, then they know, mm -hmm. right? They're not going to step into it. But Angel's Grace is a uh, one white mana for a split second instant card that says you can't lose the game this turn and your opponents can't win the game this turn until end of turn damage that would reduce your life total to less than one reduces it to one instead and this is mm. i think a good version of this whereas they don't know that's in your hand and right. it can kind of work like you said like that crop yeah. rotation thing yeah and it's split second yeah, yeah. it's very good all right, to the listeners, how do you ensure victory in your friend groups? Are there ways that you do it that are more political than card-based, or are you more of a card-based player that uses that then to sort of move your politics along? And I guess for those of you that have watched the game, uh, the Extra Turns episode and now understand that that wasn't a Stacks deck, but it was a Hate Bear deck, what are your thoughts on Hate Bears in general or Stacks-like effects if it's not the full-on lockdown the game? Is it something that you would think that you'd maybe include more in your playgroup or something that they would be so opposed to that it's, nah, nah, never do that. We're just playing cards and going for it each time. We'd what do you know. think about Blood Moon? <laughs> and why do you hate it? Yeah, Blood Moon, yeah. yes or no? Hit up, hit no, no, up I just want to hear why you hate it. If okay, you Blood like Moon. it, then just don't... <laughs> then don't say it. just shut up. Just stay out of the comments. Yeah, yeah. Find, find something else to talk about, right? Don't talk about Blood Moon if you enjoy it at all whatsoever. Um, 
<laughs> big shout out to cardkingdom.com slash command zone again that is our affiliate link if you want to buy any of the cards that we talked about today sans blood moon or ways to remove blood moon that's the best place to do it they have the best graded cards on the market they're also super fast through their shipping their customer service is top notch anything that you want in the magic space you're going to buy it anyway right sealed products singles go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone by doing so you support our show and everything that we do here at the command zone yeah, and when you get a hold of all those cards, you want to keep them in really good condition. You want them to be looking awesome, too. So maybe check out these new Ooh. Eclipse Pro Gloss sleeves from Ultra Pro. These are the ones that are really going to show off your foils Super really cleanly, exciting. the vibrancy of your cards. Also, they have the brand new Mythic Collection with the nice stitching. And also, it has like a nice stitched um, Planeswalker symbol on it. It looks super classy. They have a bunch of different uh, styles of deck boxes and stuff. Um, Mythic Collection from Ultra Pro, definitely worth checking out. All right, now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. Uh, Jesper, do you have anything cool to talk about? Yes. All right. Uh, or at least it's cool to me. Um, bird watching. Oh, it's oh. <laughs> funny. We were just talking about this uh, just, with somebody. I forget who. I took it up again because uh, during the beginning of the coronavirus, uh, you weren't able to see anyone. Right, but you right. Can go but you out see birds. <laughs> so yeah, so I would take my I would take my son with the binoculars out in the wild and start looking at birds, and we had so much fun. Oh, do you, have like, a, you, do you do. have like a book or something that you kind of check to see what you're finding, what you're looking at? books and i have a website i check where the rare birds are and then i go out with my binoculars and my son and we find them it's a fantastic fun experience to have and it you're you're not uh, you're not spreading a virus you're just going out in nature That's yeah seems I, really easy to get into as well you just go out there and look for birds they say it's getting yeah, really popular right now for those very reasons like there's a couple of things that are getting popular plants and growing stuff right right and then going out and doing bird watching what's the coolest rarest bird that you've ever seen the the coolest bird I saw during the coronavirus is a peregrine falcon. Whoa, uh, the I fastest saw that bird down. on earth. It untapped five of your lands. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I saw that down by the harbor and it was uh, eating a pigeon. Whoa. So, uh, there was a lot of action going wow. on. There. Yeah, the circle yeah. of life. <laughs> is this helpful to you for your artwork? <laughs> uh, yeah, actually that was this is how I started uh, drawing and becoming an artist because when I was uh, 8 years old I was uh, a lot into bird watching. And I started drawing birds, just the birds I, I saw on my trips. And slowly that just turned into a passion for drawing. And actually, if you look back on most of my magic card art, they will have birds in it. One might argue that the biggest bird that you've drawn yet is this epic play, yes. play mat. <laughs> Giant dragon. <laughs> Dragon's yeah. a type of bird, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, we totally forgot to mention it. Before we go, let's talk one more time about our epic play playmat. In fact, let's play that cool animation again. Ooh. Ooh, so awesome. Uh, Jesper, this art, obviously, you know, you've got a lot of experience drawing these winged creatures. And make sure you guys all check yes. out the Epic Play Playmat uh, on the Kickstarter right now. It's going for a limited time. And when it's over, it is over. And you don't want to miss out because Jesper contributed a fantastic work of art to this. And you're going to want this on all of your tables. I don't think we mentioned at the start of the episode either. The, the feeling we were trying to capture in this piece uh, or in this image is that feeling you have in a game of Commander when you are crushing your opponents when you're like yes i just made an epic play i did this you kind of want to feel like the woman on the dragon who's Woo! got her hands raised and she's like i did that i rock i'm awesome i'm gonna win blood moon sucks i i think actually she just played a blood moon and this is the way she's she she's ta she's tapping all the red mana for the shivan dragon's fire breath ah, yeah! nice that's great yeah she needed more red mana so blood moon was the way to get that brilliant i love it conversation went downhill <laughs> All right, big thanks to our editing, graphics, and logistics team, which is Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Alfred Estaca, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nunn, and Sam Waldo. And big thanks, as always, to Jeffrey Palmer and Sam Waldo, who make the living card animations that sometimes live behind us here on set, or begin our show and end our show at youtube.com slash the Command Zone podcast. You can find Jeffrey at Living Cards MTG. And Jesper, where can we find you online if someone wants to tell you about how much they love Blood Moon? Uh, you can find me on Instagram, and you can find me on Facebook if you are into that stuff. <laughs> uh, and I have a webpage, yesbyising.com. Great. And, and uh, you also have a book out. It's called Elsewhere, right? 
That's right. Yeah, it's a, it's a collection of all, or not all, but a lot of Jesper's work. Um, we're told that it is four pounds wow. of fantasy art. Yes. You can measure it in pounds. And all the links to all that stuff, if you want to find Jesper's book or just find Jesper, are going to be in the show notes. Yep. Thank you so much, yes. Jesper, for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure. And of course, you know, we'll hope to have you back on again soon. Hopefully, we'll be able to get around your, uh, your hate bear shenanigans next time. You're not coming back on <laughs> unless you take Blood Moon out of the deck, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back with my uh, mono mono white super stacks. Ah, <laughs> perfect. Ruin life forever. I'm sure the audience will love that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, you guys. Thank you, Jesper. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching, and we will see you next time. Next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>